All right, welcome back to the Library of Congress National Book Festival. I'm Rich Folley. We're on the set of PBS Book View now. And what a pleasure to be sitting right now with Diane Rehm, who's the author of On My Own. Thank you. A beautiful book. And I need to say that you're here on the week of your 80th birthday, which is quite a milestone. And it's so cool to be able to spend that with you. Oh, it's my delight. Honestly, this has been such a crazy week. And I'm enjoying every minute of it. My mother-in-law told me the 80s were the very best years of her life. Oh my God. So that's what I'm looking forward well, to. Well, I know that's going to be Absolutely. true for you. But it, you know what's it, really fun for me sitting what? here is hearing your voice that I know so well, the mellifluous sounds of Diane Reem sitting on the couch next to me. So many people now know that voice from I your know. very popular NPR radio show that, that is out of here, WAMU, here in Washington. Here you are. now stepping away from the microphone after how many years? 35 years? 37. In, in 37 years 37. in radio. 37, yeah. I feel like listening to you, you could have gone on for as long as you wanted. What prompted the decision to leave the show? I thought that 37 years was enough. I thought that a younger version of this program ought to begin. Yeah. And I thought younger, fresher ideas, NPR, public radio, really needs new ideas. We're going on various platforms, all that's at work. Yeah. So I just felt, and I told my boss, my new boss, as soon as he came in, that I was going to leave after my 80th birthday. Wow. So this is the perfect time. We're here on the 80th birthday week, and I know yeah. that you're gonna stick around, I think, for a few more weeks, which we are lucky to have. Till the end of the year. Right, we'll take it all. We'll yeah, take as long as you want to stick with us. Absolutely. Well, but let's talk about your book, which okay. you've been talking about for a while now. Yeah. It's a very personal book for you, obviously. Uh, it's a story of you and your husband, John, who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease um, and his dealing with that and you dealing with that as a couple until the point when he had to take extraordinary measures to end his life in a world that does not yet endorse um, that sort of death, of taking your own life, of stepping away from things without medical intervention. Talk to me about, first of all, that early phase of that diagnosis and how your life changed immediately after the Parkinson's diagnosis with John. The, his life really did not change with the diagnosis. It did not change until he couldn't drive anymore. And once he couldn't drive anymore, that limited his life. His back began to go out. He had to have a back operation. And then he went downhill. I was truly the first person who diagnosed that something was wrong. You knew. Because this man who was so strong and so graceful in his movement began to shuffle. And when I saw and heard that shuffle, I said, something's wrong. So we ultimately got the positive diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. It was hard. It's not easy for any person to live with any kind of debilitating disease. I wrote the book because at the end of John's life, he was really ready to let go. He felt he could not use his hands, he could not walk, he could not stand, he could not even feed himself. And he said to me, I'm ready to go. And he told his doctor, our son, our daughter, who is also a doctor, that he was ready to go. He thought he could get help from the doctor. But since he was in Maryland, and Maryland is not one of the five states that has approved death with dignity, 
he didn't have any choice other than to stop eating, stop taking medication, and stop drinking water. And without water, one's organs begin to fail pretty quickly. You said it, it took 10 days for that period when John stopped taking water and food for him to die. And that, right. those 10 days uh, have driven you to become a very fierce advocate for death with dignity or for the choice. Uh, for and, choice. And I'd love for you to talk about that idea of choice. You're, you're, you're not an advocate necessarily for this, but you do believe in having the choice. Here is what I believe in. If you are a person of God, and you believe that God is the only being who has the right to take your life, I support you a thousand percent. If, on the other hand, you believe that you want every single element that modern medicine can provide, and you want to continue with that, I support you a thousand percent. And if you, at the end, are in such physical, mental anguish, and you say, I am ready to die, I support you a thousand percent. So I am supporting the right to choose and hoping that what's happened in California with the governor of California receiving a letter from the Dalai Lama, receiving a letter from Bishop Tutu, and finally signing into law the right to death with dignity. I hope that that's going to be a turning point and that we are going to see many more states. Colorado has a voter initiative that if it wins a majority could become law. The District of Columbia is currently debating this and it could become law. We'll see what the Congress does with that. Nevertheless, I think people are now thinking about it, talking about it. I spoke the other day with Dan Diaz the husband of Brittany Menard, and the pain that that family and that young woman went through, no one should have to deal with. Yeah, and tell us who, tell us who these people are for people that may not oh, know. Oh, forgive me. Brittany Menard was the young woman who a year or so after she was married discovered she had inoperable brain cancer. She decided after a certain number of treatments, she did not want to go on any longer, that she wanted to end her life without intense suffering, which would have caused blindness, paralysis, total vomiting, constant pain. And so she and her husband, Dan Diaz, and her mother moved to Oregon, where death with dignity is the law. Mm -hmm. And so they lived there, and she died there on the day she chose yeah. to die there. There's been some really uh, touching accounts of people who've chosen that path. Um, of the ceremonies and of the family gatherings and exactly. things—they're heartbreaking, obviously, as well. But, but um, I think that there is a a way to do something that that still preserves the beauty of life and that doesn't sacrifice any of those those things that are held sacred by so many on the other side. But it's it's such a contentious issue. You're now being drawn into the discussion and the debate. What do you see as your role going forward in this? I'm going to speak out on this wherever I'm invited. Um, I so strongly believe that when my time comes, I want to be able to gather in my family, have a wonderful glass of champagne, kiss them all, hug them all, and say goodbye 
in a loving environment, in my own bed, in my own apartment. I don't want to be intubated. I don't want to be in a hospital all hooked up with tubes. I want to have a peaceful death with dignity. And for those who would choose that, I hope there will be many, many more activists on this front yeah. because I so strongly believe it will become the law of yeah. the land. Well, you're doing really important work there. Thank you. But the other part of this book, obviously, is about you stepping off into your own life and sort of building a life by yourself without your husband, John, um, and to creating the next phase of your life as you head into your 80s. That's been quite a, a big step for you as well. How, is, how do you feel like you're adjusting to your life without your husband, John, and the next phase of your life? You know, even before John died, he moved to assisted living for, he was there for about a year and a half. And what I realized was that my life alone had begun yeah. in a small way. I mean, I could call him, I could go see him every single day, I could tell him what I was doing on the radio program, he would comment back to me, he would talk to me about, he, I would walk in, he'd say, oh, you look so beautiful, oh, I love what you have on, oh, it's so nice to see you. You know, and that kind of support, personal support, personal love, how I miss that, yeah. how I miss that. Yeah, and it's sometimes, it's been, what was wonderful to read too in the book is that the way that you also look back on your relationship, which wasn't always easy. Absolutely. But that, but that you look back on it now with a, a different kind of warmth from a distance. You're absolutely right that now, Two and a half years after he's died, it's almost as though I don't want to remember anything but the good times. Right. And, and that's lovely. And he said he was looking forward to his next journey. Yeah. And I feel the same way. Right. Well, your journey has begun. You're stepping away from WAMU and NPR, but you're moving into your 80s with vigor. And it's so wonderful to have you. What an honor. Diane Thank Reen, you. good luck with everything. Thanks for all of the years of great service to all of us radio listeners. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah. I want you to know I'm going to do a podcast. Oh, are you? After I leave you're the daily program, of I course am not. nowhere near of course done. Not. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Diane Reem. Right. The book is on my own, Diane Reem. 